Hello, I'm Yvette Torres, and welcome to another edition of The Road to Recovery. Today we'll be talking about trauma and justice issues and the delivery of services through behavioral health settings. Joining us in our panel today are Dr. Joan Galise, Project Director and Principal Trainer, SAMHSA National Center for Trauma-Informed Care, Rockville, Maryland. Tonier Kane, Team Leader and Director of Peer Consumer Involvement, SAMHSA Promoting Alternatives to Seclusion and Restraint Through Trauma-Informed Practice, Rockville, Maryland. Dr. H. Wesley Clark, Director, Center for Substance Abuse Treatment, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Rockville, Maryland. Dr. Maxine Harris, CEO and co-founder, Community Connections, Washington, D.C. Dr. Clark, what is trauma and how do we define trauma? The definition of trauma is uh, a little ambiguous, but it, it's tied to specific adverse events that a person may experience or a community may experience, including disasters, uh, physical or sexual abuse, war, uh, witnessing the above-mentioned uh, incidents of that nature. It can be psychological as well as physical. Uh, and there are a wide range of issues associated with uh, the definition. Very good. And um, what are the various sources of trauma? Well, the sources are similar to the precipitant. Uh, it can be from a, uh, a relative or a partner. It can be in war uh, from uh, the enemy. It could be from tornadoes or hurricanes or floods. Uh, it could be from um, uh, predators who are in the community, uh, unbeknownst to the victim, a person who's victimized from either physical assault or rape or events like that. Uh, so uh, the, it could be from a loved one or it can be from, from a total stranger. Dr. Galise, um, basically how is trauma closely tied with substance use and mental health issues? Well, we believe that uh, symptoms are adaptations and frequently the way people cope with their trauma is through using, is oftentimes through self-inflicted violence, is oftentimes with other self-protective um, issues that the people that people are involved in to protect themselves against the trauma. In mental health, we see a lot of diagnoses that are actually trauma-related. Clearly, the post-traumatic stress disorder is one, but a lot of affective disorders are oftentimes really trauma-based. A lot of the issues with people with the access to or the personality disorders, the people that are labored borderline personality, we oftentimes see a untreated early experience of um, physical sexual abuse, abandonment, neglect, or the witnessing of violence. Ms. Kane, you're working now with, as a peer uh, to peer counselor in our center. And uh, talk to us about what was your initial experience with trauma? Well, all of my life I've been traumatized. I grew up in a household where I was sexually abused by um, men in the community that used to visit my mother. And um, it's, I think I really vivid of a lot of the flashbacks at age nine. I'm pretty sure it probably happened earlier, but a lot of that comes from age nine is when I realized that, oh my goodness, this is not how it's supposed to be. And I started drinking as a result because I couldn't cope with it. At that early age? At age nine. I drank every day at age nine because it helped me to numb out what was going on in my life. So um, after being in a household of sexual, verbal, and physical abuse, I ended up in foster care and then put into um, with place with a family member only for my mother to come back to get me and to be exposed to even more trauma. Um, married at a very young age who my husband beat me and, and was Ver verbally, physically, horrible, horrible abuser. And, um, and so the cycle just continued. And at around age 19, you know, I, I, because I created a belief system, I am nothing, I never amount to anything, because I thought that this, these things were supposed to happen to me. So when someone came to me at age 19 and said, try this, it was crack cocaine. 
It was the answer to all of my problems. I never had to feel anything ever again. I could just numb out. So my trauma started very early and it continued through the system only to be put into services where I was being re-traumatized by those that were providing services for me. And Dr. Harris, is that typical? Is that a typical um, scenario of some of the folks that experience trauma? Well, I, I think what happens is that trauma breaks out of the normal expected life trajectory. I mean, you're kind of going along, and you, you don't expect the men who come to your house to rape you. Uh, you don't expect your mother to go out on a drunk binge and leave you alone. Um, what you think is normal life just doesn't happen to you, so you adapt. And you adapt by drinking, you adapt by getting into relationships that may be destructive, you adapt by finding some way to physically or psychologically run away. And Dr. Clark, this happens, um, I suspect that because of this dynamic, there are an awful lot of people, and we're going to get back to Ms. Kane's experience, but that end up in our jail systems, that end up in our, our justice system. Is that correct? That is true. Um, there are a lot of people as a result, as Ms. Kane indicated, uh, you start using uh, drugs that are illegal, and as a result of that, you wind up uh, getting arrested, and as a result of that, you wind up in jail. Uh, and depending upon the situation. Uh, as a result of using drugs, you may become violent and you wind up in jail because of that situation. Or as a result of uh, numbing out, you wind up engaging in, quote, illegal acts and you wind up in, in jail. So uh, a large number of people who are in jail or in prison are there for possession of drugs uh, or for criminal acts associated with uh, drug use or drug abuse. And that is uh, one of the concerns that we have, particularly when many of these individuals have previously been traumatized. And as uh, Dr. Harris pointed out, uh, what they're doing is uh, trying to cope with life experiences or situational experiences that are outside the uh, normal range of human experience and uh, they cannot find relief any other way. And do we know what the percentage is of the individuals that are in the criminal justice system that experience, uh, have experienced trauma? Well, there are upward to 85% we know of women in the justice system, same kind of percentage of girls in the juvenile justice system. I think it's just um, you know, overwhelming the number of individuals that are traumatizing these systems. And what we're trying to do is to really develop programs where we start to address what happened to you you know, versus what's wrong with you. I think that was your phrase, Maxine, that what, what, what was wrong versus what happened versus what's wrong. So we can start to kind of chisel away at, at, at what happened so we can start to build people back up with strength-based kind of programming. And I think women are particularly vulnerable because if you take a look at it on the sexual abuse side, one in, you know, almost 21 in four, <coughs> Uh, it is the, the, the statistics that I've seen, and also in terms of domestic violence, 15 to 45 percent, anywhere between uh, 15 and 45 percent. So uh, it, it's, it's, um, uh, that issue is particularly acute, I think, in, in terms of what the outcomes may be for, for the criminal justice system, sure. correct? And I think the multiple systems that you find individuals with trauma histories um, intersecting with, you can look at the homeless programs, the substance use, the mental health, um, people in the state hospitals and juvenile justice. And I think that common thread is that untreated early experience of childhood trauma. And for the men, of course, I mean, I think particularly the, the military uh, comes to mind that you've mentioned before, Dr. Clark, with the post-traumatic and the traumatic brain injuries that, that we're experiencing now? Well, if you are focusing only on the criminal justice system, the military uh, returning veterans often have problems. But you also have to recognize that there are settings where trauma is uh, common. So, uh, Which um, are? Jails can be in prisons where there's physical violence uh, or the lifestyle of using drugs where people become vulnerable. Uh, the, there is this uh, gradation in traumatic experiences that we have to take into consideration. Women are more likely to be victims of sexual assault, although men are also the victims of se sexual assault, but women are more likely. 
Uh, on the other hand, uh, men are more likely to uh, be victims of physical assault uh, or engage in physical assault, so that uh, then puts them in situations where they get incarcerated. Uh, the key issue that you're hearing uh, uh, Dr. Galise and, and, um, and me mention, and that is making sure we assess for trauma as an integral part of any kind of assessment that we're dealing with. So we're not dealing with the, the abuse excuse. What we're dealing with is if indeed we want to break the cycle, we need to start with assessing the situation and informing the victim uh, of what's really going on in their lives and in a way to start dealing with that. It's almost like opening a curtain, you know, for that individual to, to have help them see reality. And when we come back, I really want to focus more on, on children, youth, and, and families and trauma. We'll be right back. SAMHSA has an initiative about trauma and justice, and we're really trying to work with uh, the idea of trauma and its impact on physical illness, its impact on the community's health, and its impact on service delivery systems and what they need to do and their effectiveness. So we are uh, increasingly engaged in a conversation with other delivery systems, whether it's child welfare systems in which most of the children in that system have suffered some form of trauma in childhood or whether it's the justice system in which many, many individuals in that system are experiencing trauma and have related behavioral health issues. When we talk about trauma-informed care, it is something you screen for, it is also something that you include in the treatment strategy, and in some cases it's, all, it's so paramount that if you fail to deal with it, you fail to address what's truly going on with the person. So a person who's a victim of domestic violence, for instance, who presents to you for alcohol and drug use, and all you focus on is alcohol and drugs, you're not dealing with the domestic violence. You're not putting that person in a safe environment. You want to return them to a hostile environment, and that certainly Will, will not be good for them in terms of their physical health, but it's also not good for them with, with regard to the mental health or with regard to the substance use disorder. People trapped by drug or alcohol addiction often feel like there's no hope, no way out. But for every lock, there's a key. And if you have a problem, it's good to know there are real solutions to help you get free. For drug or alcohol treatment referral for you or someone you know, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. For seven years ago, I was sleeping underneath a bridge on the streets for 19 years, eating out of a trash can, going in and out of correctional and mental health system. I racked up 83 arrests and 66 convictions, all due to my substance abuse because I was trying to cope with the trauma that had happened in my life. And I would go in and out of prison and they would say, this is how you're going to spend the rest of your life or you're going to die in the streets. Once I was able to go to a program where my trauma was addressed, the Tamar Children program, my trauma was ad identified, addressed, and treated, um, I was able to change my belief system from I am nothing to I am somebody and I can be anything I want in this world. See, when my belief system changed, my thought process changed. And I started to make the best decisions based on me believing that I was worth a better life. Dr. Harris, let's focus a little bit on issues of trauma for children and youth. You've worked with families, you work with children and youth. What has been the typical experience uh, uh, within your center? One of the things that's very interesting is we see about 500 children a year and almost every child we see has a mother who is also in services. A mother who has been abused, who has been diagnosed with mental illness, or who is currently abusing substances. So our children are at least second generation, sometimes third generation trauma survivors. And, and that's called generational trauma, correct? It, it is a transgenerational phenomena where the traumatic experience is uh, tragically passed 
from one generation to another. Uh, sometimes because mothers who themselves have been victimized do not know how to protect their sons and daughters from the same victimization that befell them. And Dr. Clark, let's get into the issue of, of race and ethnicity. This has happened more poignantly within the Native American and African American communities in terms of the same phenomena. Well, I think trauma happens in every community. We want to make that clear. Now, with regard to the Native American community, you've got the concomitant issue of historical trauma, the similar uh, phenomenon in the African American community. And that uh, gives this intergenerational phenomenon where you've got uh, abuse, you've got uh, sexual abuse, et cetera. But the, uh, the American Indian and Alaska Native communities point to historical trauma as something that needs to be addressed. And uh, it, without addressing it, then you wind up uh, essentially blaming the whole community for uh, some of the, the consequences. But uh, and in fact, uh, the community wants to deal with violence against women, uh, incest, uh, these uh, transgenerational traumatic experiences that almost guarantee the next generation is going to have similar experiences. And it goes from one to the other to the other. Um, I want to get back also getting back to, to you've got children, Ms. Kane, and, and are they in a way, um, have they received treatment and, and with you in terms of working out some of the issues that you've experienced? I had five kids, four of my kids were taken away from me because of the way that I dealt with my trauma, the substance abuse, um, the um, convictions and all the things that just were just symptoms of my trauma, the homelessness of 19 years. So for four of my kids, as I was giving birth to them and they were um, born as a result of rapes and prostitution um, were taken away from me. So I ended up in a program Finally, um, I was in prison for violation of parole and I was pregnant again and I was terrified I was about to lose another baby and then I found out about this program called Tamar Children and Dr. Galise is one of the founders of this program and they said, you know, it helps you work on your trauma. I didn't know what trauma was. I figured I had it. I had everything else. <laughs> your addiction, your mental health and you recover. I had a substance abuse problem. They kept diagnosing me with all these mental health illnesses. So perfect program. And and I was able to keep my baby. And this program was also a program based on how to um, create and develop a secure attachment with your children. Because well, if you don't know, you don't know. If you don't know how to be nurturing and loving, you come from an abusive household, it takes work sometimes not to be abusive. And um, I was thinking about Dr. what Dr. Clark said and talking about, I don't think trauma so much as Dr. Clark would say is not in any other um, cultures. I just think there were different support in place for those that had been traumatized and you know the Caucasians or, or you know it was important to place as African American when something happened to us we don't go to services we deal with it the way we deal with it or we go to churches that's what African American do we go to churches for help and churches don't know anything about trauma. A lot of trauma happened in the churches. so Or it goes to the silence right. within families you about it, traumatic right. experiences of the family. Right. Correct, Dr. Harris? You know, I think a lot of families uh, keep trauma a secret. Yes. Uh, this may be true in the African American community, but honestly, I see this across the board. Absolutely. This is the dirty little secret that nobody wants to talk about in public. Right. I think that's the, the key issue. In fact, we do have a faith-based program at SAMHSA. The objective is to educate uh, members of the faith community about a wide range of issues, mental health issues, uh, substance abuse issues, and, and trauma. Uh, because we find that uh, the ministers, the rabbis, the imams, uh, the religious leaders uh, do want to know because they're unable to uh, be, have a positive impact if they're not uh, aware of some of these issues. We don't ask people to change their philosophical or theological beliefs. We do want them to be familiar with some of the negative of consequences that do uh, result from uh, physical abuse, uh, sexual abuse, uh, mm -hmm. violation of trust that happens in uh, households, uh, as uh, Ms. Kane pointed out. And I, I think it's significant what happens when you tell. 
um, were you believed, were you told to keep those dirty little secrets in the house, as Dr. Yeah. Harris said? So what and how you were soothed when you told? There's many folks that we've worked with, many women in the criminal justice system are very clear when they were told they were not believed. They were told to keep that secret in the house. Mm -hmm. They were told they were making it up. They were told, why were you flirting with my man? Mm -hmm. And so what happens when we tell, I think, is, uh, is really significant. Okay, we can further traumatize, you know, once yes. the person discloses. I think that's, yes. that's one of the main issues. Um, the other factor, we've mentioned the military, we've mentioned women, and, uh, youth and children, and, 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 and the whole issue of families. Another sector of society that also suffers tremendously is the gay and lesbian, the LGBT community. Uh, and uh, uh, in particular now with, with some of the incidents that we have seen on television, of violence against them. Uh, how, do we, how do we handle, I mean, are there particular efforts in place to, to really address those issues? Yeah, we have a program at Community Connections specifically for uh, lesbian and transgendered uh, folks. Uh, and it focuses in on the additional uh, feeling of disaffiliation, of stigma that people experienced uh, when they tried to come out to family members. Uh, there are very few communities, regrettably, uh, where you are easily embraced when you reveal an alternate lifestyle. So that you may have been traumatized physically or sexually as a child, but then as you come to identify yourself more fully as a person, you're traumatized all over again for your honesty. And we get into also, I mean, the, the whole bullying aspect within the schools, you know, not only against LGBT uh, uh, youth that are, that are experimenting and really haven't made up their minds as to their sexuality and so on and so forth. But on top of that, then you lay the layer of, of the trauma in school, correct, Dr. Clark? Well, yes, uh, that's part of the uh, kind of traumatic experience that uh, Dr. Harris was talking about. And again, working with uh, different agencies, we're trying to educate providers and educators as well as family members about the experiences of LGBT youth so that we can minimize bullying and uh, offer uh, young people uh, an opportunity to figure out uh, how they want to identify themselves. Uh, that's why the phrase we currently use is LBGTQ. Uh, so as, especially when you're young, you're trying Which to figure out means questioning. So there are some, exactly. there, are, uh, there are people who wonder about their sexual orientation. There are people who've decided what their sexual orientation is. Some decide early, some decide later. But the key issue is that a person should be able to make that decision without fear of uh, social retribution, whether it's physical or psychological retribution, or uh, essentially being banished. So as Dr. Harris pointed out, uh, not only your peer group, but also your family members. And so you're definitely isolated. And puts you at greater risk because uh, we find uh, a number of LGBT youth uh, running away, uh, living on the streets, and being the victims of pedophiles and sexual predators, uh, which just makes life uh, really miserable. So now they're not dealing with sexual orientation, they're really basically dealing with sexual trauma. And I think it's even an issue when the youth are in in home care, in facility care, when residential care. We see it in the residential treatment centers, in, in services for adolescents, in juvenile detention. So we see that whole re-traumatizing played out again in those facilities. And the reason that we've gone so deeply into really um, establishing a framework of who's affected is that it's such a... a uh, an insidious problem, and it is everywhere. And when you when you really think about it, you know, if you take a look at the populations that are affected, you know, the family certainly uh, encompasses everyone. Uh, I'm sure that everyone has one trauma or another in their family. So when we come back, I want to focus on now solutions and how do we solve the problem. We'll be right back. Before, addiction and depression kept me from living my life. 
And now, every step I take in recovery benefits everyone. There are many options that make the road to recovery more accessible. It begins with the first step. Join the Voices for Recovery. For information and treatment referral for you or someone you love, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Recovery benefits everyone. I started my own company. I got my dad back. My friends believe in me. Daddy's home. Substance use and mental disorders can be treated. It all starts on day one. Join the Voices for Recovery. For information and treatment referral for you or someone you love, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Community Connections is the largest not-for-profit mental health agency in the District of Columbia. We serve probably about 3,500 women, children, and men uh, who are frequently duly diagnosed, have histories of homelessness, and have histories of traumatic victimization. The mission of Community Connections, uh, first of all, is mental health, um, making everybody whole. Uh, the people who have suffered from trauma, people who have substance abuse, to give you the tools to be able to manage your mental health and, and issues and your trauma issues such as PTSD, to make you to be able to function out on the outside in public despite what things have happened to you. Sisters Empowering Sisters is a program for women who are duly diagnosed with psychiatric illness and addiction uh, and who are the victims of violence uh, to serve as peer mentors uh, for other women who have similar histories. I love the, um, the peers. I have to talk about them because I can talk to any of them. They're, they're very understanding. They have a whole lot of um, strength with them and their confidence. And you can talk about some stuff and then they make you feel so welcome and they give you that love and that caring and that respect. Peer recovery support services are consumers helping other consumers. We've been through training and we facilitate groups on various topics from women's health to trauma survival, substance abuse issues, with different topics each week from, for instance, evaluating relationships, red flags for domestic violence, and things of that issue that women struggle with. We also have a computer lab and we're here to assist you in developing a resume or online job searches. One of the goals is to promote a positive, supportive environment to foster women's growth. And another goal is to increase the knowledge of local resources that are welcoming and responsive. I just like the atmosphere. It's a good spirit in that center because it's, it's women that understand what you're going through. So uh, groups is where it's based on everybody giving feedback about a topic. So it's, it's like we just, it's a women's rap, you know? So we just constantly sharing our experiences and, um, what we hope our goals would be and, and it's just empowering you know because you don't feel alone. I think a lot of people don't understand that how men deal with trauma and substance abuse issues are different from how women deal with trauma and substance abuse issues. Being able to feel heard and understood being able to believe that the cycle of violence is something that can be interrupted is something that restores hope.
to people. And I've, I've talked to a number of women and said, well, why couldn't you do this on your own? And people will say, you know, I had lost all sense of motivation. I had lost all belief that the future could be better than the past. It seemed that I was trapped in a kind of cycle where bad things repeated themselves over and over and over again. And Sisters Empowering Sisters gives women a sense that the future can be different. My life was very unstable before I found recovery. Now that I have recovery, I have a purpose. I have a reason for living. I have direction. I have goals. I have peace. Dr. Clark, what is trauma-informed care? What we'll do is listen to Dr. Harris and Dr. Galise, uh, but the most important thing is care that takes in consideration the traumatic experiences that a person may have had. It is care that recognizes that uh, trauma is a very real possibility. You, when you take a look at the statistics and you find a lot of people who present for treatment, whether it's traditional mental health treatment or substance abuse treatment or a combination, or people who uh, enter the criminal justice system, a significant number have had traumatic experiences. So if we're going to intervene in a positive way, we have to take into consideration. And there are various strategies that allow us to take into consideration. But the most important part of it is the beginning, acknowledging that trauma could have happened in that person's life. And Dr. Galise, how do we, how do we screen for that? Well, I think when you do trauma-informed care, I think what's really important, too, is to create environments of care that do no more harm. There are many different screenings that we can use for trauma, but I think then it's really important for those systems to be prepared to do something about it. Once can you tell us a little bit screen. of which ones we're using? Well, there's, there's many different. There's many, many different trauma screens. We use everything from brief trauma screens to the ACE study to short screens that are used to try to not re-traumatize, for example, in jail, that just made ask four or five questions. So there's many, many trauma screens that, that, that are um, very good and, and excellent for use. And what well, type of questions are they, for example? Well, some questions are like, for the brief ones that we have used in, in, in prisons and jails would be, are you oftentimes haunted by terrible memories? Do you often have lapses of memory that weren't resulting in alcohol or drug abuse? Do you have nightmares? I mean, there's certain questions that are used that are geared towards not re-traumatizing and ask people to mm -hmm. spill out all of the traumas, but will then get people screened so they can be invited into the appropriate groups. But in addition to the, the screening, I think what's so important is then what do we do about it? How do we train the staff to recognize you know, what is a flashback? What are the symptoms of trauma? How someone who's self-injuring really is not manipulative attention-seeking, but is really relief-seeking, solution-seeking? How do we help staff understand, again, that those symptoms are adaptations? So what happens next to me is the most significant. We know the literature says that the majority of people coming into our public systems have histories of trauma. So, so we know that, and trauma-informed care is really creating that environment that recognizes the trauma and seeks to don't, do no more harm. And Dr. Harris, what is it that we need to do in terms of children who have experienced trauma to help them lead a more a healthy life? You know, I, I think, let me take a step back for just a moment, uh, because I think we don't want to make this sound more complicated, honestly, than it is. Uh, we humans are wired for resilience. Uh, and the truth is, we all go through a range of events that could be labeled as traumatic, and most of us survive and adapt, and we adapt in ways that allow us to lead productive lives. So having experienced a traumatic event is not a curse necessarily. Uh, it is something to which you have to adapt, to which you have to cope. Uh, but it is not, uh, you know, something that means, oh my goodness, this happened to me, so my life is over and the mental health professionals have to swoop in and save me. Uh, in terms of uh, assessing children and adults, again, it's just not that complicated. We ask about four or five questions, uh, and we uh, assess 40 to 60 people every single week. 
Uh, the questions are quite direct. Have you ever been hit? Has anybody ever touched you in a way that made you uncomfortable? And those questions do not re-traumatize people. In fact, uh, they're very glad to ask, answer them if they're asked in a non-threatening way. So Dr. Clark, once we have established that the children have had some type of trauma uh, based on the questions that we've asked, uh, what, how do we try to, to begin the intervention with them? Well, I think they, one of the most important things, especially if we're dealing with youth, is uh, creating an environment where they feel safe. And I think that's what uh, Dr. Gleese was uh, pointing at. Uh, the environment has to be safe, and as Dr. Harris pointed out, the person has to feel comfortable uh, talking about something that they have a need to talk about. But uh, as Ms. Kane pointed out, they were essentially told uh, they were blamed for the event. So the secret has to be retained, and you're now giving them permission to talk about the secret. And you're also reassuring them that there will be no negative consequences about uh, talking about the secret. And so it's a lot easier for the person to, to talk in that environment. And there are strategies, uh, various uh, treatment-oriented strategies that are geared to uh, functionally allowing the person to disclose, reaffirming that safety is a uh, ubiquitous, at least in the environment where they're being uh, cared for, and, and also making it clear that they are not to blame. Uh, so that this whole issue of self-loathing uh, that Ms. Kane talked about in terms of not desiring, uh, 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 not believing that you're entitled to anything else uh, goes away so that the person then can start to believe that uh, they can recover. And this is from the notion of resiliency. Resiliency needs to be essentially unleashed uh, as opposed to uh, uh, bottled up. And, so and resiliency really, uh, Ms. Kane, needs to start with the parents in terms of how they interact with that child, correct? Well, yeah. I mean, you, we, children have learned behaviors. And I, was, I just want to just quickly speak about assessments. These questions have been asked always. We always ask those questions. I have always been asked, have you ever been a victim of sexual abuse? Have you ever been a victim? They always were checked. And we talk about assessment forms, and that's great. Yes, we need to, to be able to assess, but we need to be prepared to hear the answers. You can ask these questions all you want, but if you're not prepared to hear the answers, you're going to, you're going to create more harm this individual. And so that, that is, that's, that's what we're talking about in trauma-informed care. You ask these questions, and then what? It's preparing to hear the answer, putting to place plans for individuals, treating as an individual according to their own individualized trauma because believe me, the person that assaulted me probably didn't assault somebody else that's in the group. We have different predators, so we have different things we remember. That means our triggers are different. If that's the case, then our warning sign is gonna be different. Ah, and if that's the case, the plan putting to place to help us to self-manage self should be different. So yes, these questions need to, we have to have these assessment too, but be ready to hear the answer. And the people that ask the question, how do we know that they're not been traumatized? Just because we have these letters behind our names and we become, doesn't mean that they have not experienced some trauma, untreated trauma, and could be triggered. I mean, I can't tell you how many providers email me and come up to me and say, that happened to me, and every day I make decisions based on what happened to me for another individual. You know, I, I'm sorry. No, I was going to say, Ms. Kane, e even though I, I totally agree with mm -hmm. you that uh, things need to be individualized, mm -hmm. there are some things that we know that are general for all people. I mean, I need to know how to comfort myself. Mm -hmm. uh, and the way I gain comfort may be different from the way you right. gain comfort. Mm -hmm. But in order for me to cope with the things that happen in my life, it's really quite simple. I need strategies right. for comforting myself. And those strategies cannot be using drugs, right prostituting uh, or sleeping all day because that's often what people try because they're sort of easy and sometimes readily at hand. I need healthy ways right. to comfort myself. Right, and if you're talking about individuals in a program, so, you know, that's not even an option using drugs and all the prostitution and all that. We're talking about those that's in 
providing settings. And so we've got to find ways, like you said, positive ways to help self So What I'm saying is we can't automatically assume because I'm a rape victim and she's a rape victim that nighttime is a bad time for me. Exactly. That's, that's so what, what I'm you're saying, saying is individualized <clears throat> uh, uh, p treatment plans right. for each individual. And, and in um, addition to that, I, I think what's, what's so important is the environments of care, um, particularly residential, mm -hmm. that can be so traumatizing. The experience of seclusion and restraint, it's horrifically traumatizing for the individual being tied down and restrained. It's traumatizing for the other folks who are watching it. It's traumatizing for the staff that are doing it. The experience of, you know, whether it, whether it is bedtime. I've heard people say standing in lines or right. all sorts of things within our institutions that we could do to create environments, again, that are safe right. and that are calm and that are healing. The key issue yes, that is uh, something that uh, Dr. Gleese mentioned earlier, is the staff trained. Absolutely. And that allows then for staff who've had previous experiences not to be able to project those on the yes. clients. It allows the staff to be able to hopefully make decisions, well, gee, that person's experiences are too similar to mine, and I can't comfortably work in that uh, with this particular person, but I can work with that particular person. The, and that's the part that we want to uh, address in, in this uh, section, and is making sure that all parties involved understand that trauma as Dr. Harris pointed out, is such a ubiquitous experience, the key issue in the assessment, you have to be comfortable with that and to recognize, okay, I'm either in over my head because of self-identification, or I'm not really sure what to do. So you have an environment where there's adequate supervision and adequate opportunity for discourse so that the uh, client doesn't feel that for some reason they're pushing away help because that help is uncomfortable dealing with the issue. So yes, Ms. Kane is right, it's more than just checking a box, but it also means that you have to be schooled. And when we come back, we're gonna to continue to talk a little bit about what we can tell parents uh, to do in order to help their children deal with trauma. We'll be right back. For more information on National Recovery Month, to find out how to get involved or to locate an event near you, visit the Recovery Month website at recoverymonth.gov. Treat me. Treat me with understanding. Treat me. Treat me with courtesy. Drug and alcohol addiction is an equal opportunity disease. Individuals in recovery come from all walks of life and deserve to be treated with respect and admiration for winning one of the hardest battles there is. Treat me without judgment. Treat me with humanity. Alcohol and drug addiction deserves proper treatment. For drug and alcohol information and treatment referral, call 1-800-662-HELP. Understanding the impact of trauma on the justice system is an integral part of the dependency drug court system in Sacramento, California. Dependency drug court brings together the Superior Court, Child Protective Services, Alcohol and Drug Services, Sacramento Child Advocates, Parents Advocates of Sacramento, Dependency Associates of Sacramento, Bridges Stars Program, and Sacramento Treatment Providers. Parents in the program not only receive treatment, but gain an understanding of the root causes of their disease in an effort to break the intergenerational cycle of trauma. We were failing our families. Uh, before Dependency Drug Court, we only had 18% of families who actually reunified and had their children come home and their cases closed out with parents who no longer had substance abuse problems. As I went through the STARS program and realized that these people that are trying to teach me about my disease have gone through it themselves. It was a blessing because it wasn't somebody who's never experienced what I've experienced telling me what I need to learn. Somebody who had actually been there and was doing the deal, staying sober one day at a time. Everyone agrees that we want parents to be safe, nurturing parents. Everyone agrees that good quality treatment on demand is important and everybody agrees accountability is needed for people to succeed. And so everyone came together and said, those five or six things we agree with. The STARS program collects data and shares with 
child welfare, CPS, dependency drug court, and treatment providers. We generate a twice monthly report which consists of treatment attendance, testing results, number of contacts that clients are required to meet with their recovery specialists, and how many support group meetings they've attended that they were required to attend. Those first few years were critical. So we really watched everything and it was important that we shared our information and that we were all up front with what we were doing. Everyone was involved with building our policies and procedures. An additional component to the Dependency Drug Court program in Sacramento County is the use of two different curriculums regarding trauma-informed treatment. Over eight of Sacramento County's contracted treatment providers use either Beyond Trauma and or Seeking Safety, Therapy for Trauma and Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder and Substance Abuse. One treatment provider says that 99% of the women who come into treatment have lived through some type of severe trauma, often domestic violence or sexual abuse. The women learn they are not alone, that their traumatic event happened to others, it helps them to open up, talk about, and learn to heal from their experience. A relapse doesn't mean you're out and we're done with you. It means you've had a relapse, now let's keep going. We've had families where a parent has been close to graduating dependency drug court and has had a slip up. And the true test of that particular parent is, okay, I made a mistake, I'm done, I'm going to walk away. Or, okay, I made a mistake, I'm going to re-engage immediately and actively do what I've been taught to do, utilize it not only for myself, because that's the most important thing, the recovery must be for the individual, first and foremost. I remember when I graduated and she came down off of the bench to come down and take a picture with me. Um, it was like a great moment, a judge is actually coming off the bench to congratulate me on being successful. Um, six months prior, the judge had told me that I couldn't take care of my own child, and now they're telling me, congratulations, you've made it, you're a better person. Dr. Harris, what can parents do if their child has experienced trauma, whether it be bullying or some other type of trauma? You know, I, I think the first thing that a mother or father needs to do certainly is to be willing to listen, mm -hmm. but not to feel that this is a problem that needs to stay within the family and be solved within the family. You know, we live in a world of caring others. Mm -hmm. There are teachers, there are mentors, there are people in church and neighborhood communities. Uh, parents should reach out for help. Uh, don't sit with the pain of what you've heard and feel that it is only on your shoulders to solve it. I think the other thing, especially for moms, that's really important, is you have to read your own reaction to hearing what your child is telling you. Your child's story may remind you of an unrevealed story of your own. So if you start to remember things as you hear your child talk, the first thing you need to do is to get some help for your child. Because a mother who herself is damaged and injured cannot help her child. Very good. And Dr. Clark, you were talking about different types of scenarios in terms of how parents need to cope with different types of trauma that their children may have experience, what other types of, 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 of um, actions should parents be taking in a different scenario? Well, the most important thing is, uh, as Dr. Harris pointed out, you listen, but you should also uh, believe your child unless the evidence is uh, overwhelmingly to the contrary, which means, as Dr. Harris points out, you are taking it outside to, to explore, to get vindication. So if it's bullying, you are talking to the uh, school, you're talking to the teacher. If it's sexual assault, you're bringing in the appropriate authorities to uh, address that. If it's it's a family member, you're not keeping it a secret because uh, you're afraid of embarrassing the family. 
the issue is that the child will suffer long-term consequences and you too will suffer consequences because you are uh, either you're a victim yourself based on the past or you're sitting there harboring this piece of information which is going to have a destructive impact on you. So uh, those things become very important. So you're getting the child help, you're getting help for yourself as Dr. Harris pointed out and you're setting things in motion where you can uh, mobilize resilience by dealing with the issue directly. And Ms. Kane, you spoke of, of domestic violence, mm -hmm. that you were a victim of domestic violence once upon your time. How do, what do we tell women that are experiencing domest domestic violence? What should they be doing? Well, getting to safety. And, and that's so easy for us to say, you know. And it's so hard when you, you're living with somebody and you depend on them financially or, or whatever the case may be, or it's your husband. Um, but you need to get away because you don't deserve that. I always tell women that I were, that is not what you were meant. To. You're not a punching bag. You're not, you're so much more than that. And to get to the um, help, find out what some of the um, domestic violence shelters are. And uh, one of the most important things an individual can do when they feel like they feel lost and alone and they just in this all by themselves is seek a peer. Peer support is vital. It's invaluable, and it's one of the things that should be utilized not only in community programming, outreach centers, mental health corrections, substance abuse, wherever there are individuals that have trauma, they need a peer. They need a peer when, you, when they come in an intake, a peer when they're leaving. They need somebody to say, I understand what you've been through. Because for me, I had a lot of people sit down and ask me questions, and I'm like looking at them like, you have no idea. You. You don't understand so anything. So peers would certainly peer help, support, help in that regard. Peer support, peer support. Dr. Galise, um, in terms of how folks are going to be able to cover some of these services, what does the Affordable Care Act offer in the area of trauma-related uh, services? Well, you know, I might have to defer to someone on that because that is really not my area of expertise. So if someone else would like to answer that, I'd appreciate it, but I would like to just say one thing about what Tonya um, was saying about domestic violence. I think we really can't underestimate the needs of the children who witness domestic violence in the home. So it's not just the safety for the parent, but to get that treatment. So I'm going to throw the Dr. care to Clark. you. Well, our hope is that the Affordable Care Act will uh, provide uh, opportunities for treatment to victims of trauma, whatever the source of the problem. Trauma is. As you know, the efforts of the Affordable Care Act is to make health care available to a wider range of individuals. And uh, because they'll be providing coverage to people with lower incomes, many of whom are the victims uh, of trauma, uh, they'll be able to get assistance from uh, community health centers, providers, community mental health centers, uh, uh, social workers and psychologists and, and, and other uh, providers of care. So this will provide a mechanism both for adults and for children and adolescents. But I would like to point out that children and adolescents are often uh, they're eligible for care now through uh, other insurance programs. But the key issue is if we're not willing to get beyond the secret, uh, having access to reimbursement is irrelevant because nobody's going to show up at the door and no, no matter how skilled the clinician is they can't treat an empty chair. If I could talk just for a minute about domestic violence um, I think that this is a, a, a really a horror that affects somewhere around 30 35 percent of women and while I absolutely agree with with Miss Kane that it is critical for women to get to safety uh, no one deserves to be punched or emotionally abused very, very few women leave the first time. And I think sometimes professionals don't understand that. And they are judgmental uh, and start to think, what's wrong with her? Maybe she likes that treatment. I just want to be clear, nobody likes it. But as with a lot of uh, terrible dynamics, they're hard to break right away. If they were easy, those of us in the healthcare business would be out of business. It takes people time and we need to recognize that and not make women feel bad if they go back 
to a violent situation a couple of times before they finally free themselves. Absolutely. Very good point. And Dr. Clark, let me go back to uh, the whole notion of what SAMHSA is doing currently. One of our strategic initiatives is on trauma and justice. You want to talk a little bit about that? Well, uh, we have eight strategic initiatives at SAMHSA. One of them is indeed uh, trauma and justice, making it clear that we believe that we have to deal with trauma as an integral part of any behavioral health strategy uh, to assist uh, uh, people in need of services. So uh, the strategic initiative lead uh, is Lark Huang. Dr. Lark Huang appointed to that uh, role by Pamela Hyde, the administrator of the Substance Use Mental Health Services Administration, with the focus on working not only with issues of domestic violence, uh, but also working with the issues of the criminal justice system, because indeed, as I mentioned, it's not the abuse excuse, it is trying to break the cycle. We spend a lot of money uh, re-incarcerating individuals who have primary issues that have never dealt with. So, uh, especially in nonviolent uh, situations, we wanted to break that cycle. And as uh, Dr. Harris pointed out, uh, we also want to create a workforce that has a st uh, stable appreciation of traumatic phenomena so that, again, we don't blame the child, we don't blame the wife, we don't blame the spouse uh, who is the uh, victim of uh, trauma. And the GAIN Center also has some training programs as well as other um, in, in initiatives. Yes, we have a number of programs uh, that uh, address trauma, and one can access that from our website uh, at www.samsa.gov, uh, GAIN Center. We have a, a, a national center on traumatic stress. Uh, we've got uh, the activity that uh, uh, Dr. Gleason uh, is, uh, is engaged in, and we've got the activity that uh, Ms. Kane is uh, uh, engaged in, and we've got community programs like Ms. Dr. Harris is engaged in. They, but the key issue is uh, while we're not solely responsible for addressing these issues, we are working very aggressively. We also have partnerships with the Administration of Children and Families, uh, the uh, Department of Defense, the Department of Justice, and the Veterans Administration and, uh, and HRSA so that we deal with trauma across the board. We want it to be in primary care settings, we want people asking about it, and then we want to make sure we have a workforce that's skilled enough to begin to do something about it. And we are very glad that you have enlightened our audience related to this topic. I want to remind our audience that National Recovery Month is celebrated every September. And we're hoping that you engage and be visible and vocal during this month by hosting events. And also uh, be engaged not only with the family, but with those that are in recovery. I want to thank you for being here. It was a very good show. Thank you. For a copy of this program or other programs in the Road to Recovery series, call SAMHSA at 1-800-662-HELP or order online at recoverymonth.gov and click multimedia. Every September, National Recovery Month provides an opportunity for communities like yours to raise awareness of substance use and mental health problems, to highlight the effectiveness of treatment and that people can and do recover. In order to help you plan events and activities in commemoration of this year's Recovery Month observance, the Free Recovery Month Kit offers ideas, materials, and tools for planning, organizing, and realizing an event or outreach campaign that matches your goals and resources. To obtain your copy of this year's Recovery Month Kit and gain access to other free publications and materials related to recovery issues, visit the Recovery Month website at www.recoverymonth.gov or call 1-800-662-HELP.